Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, yeah, I almost don't want to do anything and just, you know, maybe we should get the band up and, and just, just sing, but I'll, I'll go through my message quickly and I think maybe we'll finish with a time of worship, which Amen. would be appropriate, I think, given the title of my message today. We started a new series a couple of weeks ago called Christian. What is a Christian? What do they do? And a couple of weeks ago, I, I laid out where we was going with this series. And so last, last time out, it was just a foundational word, mm. talking about the gray scale that we're all on, on this journey. And so we're ever varying degrees of maturity in our faith life. Mm. And so this week I wanted to address the topic of worship. And really what is worship and mm. why does a Christian worship? What do they do in worship? I normally start off with a silly joke. <laughs> We've said silly a lot this morning it seems, so <laughs> we may as well just go ahead with it, mightn't we? So, a worshipping old shepherd, a bit like King David, you know, he was, a, he was a worshipper, he was a shepherd. He was a bit distraught one day, he'd lost his favourite Bible whilst going out looking for a wayward sheep, just like Jesus said to do. He left his flock and he went looking for the one, he found the one and he lost his Bible. And he's reflecting on this and a couple of weeks later. When over the crest of a hill comes a sheep with something in its mouth and the sheep approaches the shepherd and the shepherd sees it's, it's his Bible and he exclaims, it's a miracle! And the sheep says, not really, your name's in the cover. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right, okay, so we've got that out of the way. We, I'm not going to make you all go around and say hello to everyone, not, not this week. But... Um, yeah, so, so this topic of worship, what is worship? I, I think, you know, we live in this age, don't we, these days, of uh, an age of information and not application. We all know the right things to do. We, we live in a world where, you know, it's all short quotes and, and pithy statements, and if it's not on TikTok or Reels, or if it's, if it's longer than 15 minutes on YouTube, we're really not interested. You know, our attention spans don't hold so to keep us going for the real depth of what what things really are, the root of things. And, and so last time out, I wore a Christian t-shirt, didn't I, which had a great quote on it by Spurgeon. It was, Christian, grow thy beard longer, right? And I thought, my, 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 my thing for this series was I was going to wear a different Christian t-shirt every week. And I knew that I had some in the cupboard. But unfortunately, either I've just become a bit too swole from all the working out I've been doing, yeah. or maybe I've just got a bit too porky from not working for the last few weeks. <laughs> and so my, my t-shirt doesn't fit me, but it does fit Isaac. Yeah, it looks good. It looks good on him, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So this is going to be a part of his, his wardrobe now, so I've got him to model it for me. You know, and uh, what a great model. Um, you know, that doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? Ah. Okay. <laughs> oh, you know, I could be in full car and we're all friends here today. Yeah. Take so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, yes, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But we do, we live in this, in this age of like, it's, it's, you know, we, we don't really want to get to the root of things. And, and for some of us, you know, we've been in church for long enough that we know. We know worship, don't we? We know where worship comes from and why we worship and why we have these things. But, but so many of us, we might not know where it all comes from. And, and so like when you're watching a film at home on Netflix or you know, you're streaming something like on Amazon Prime, you know, you can get out your phone and start Googling along if you like, because you know, we live in a distracted world, don't we? Where we can't just pay so focus and attention on any one thing for, for any real period of time. You know, we, we, need, we need something else going on in our lives as well as the thing that's going on in our lives, right? Yeah, and so here we go. So on Friday, 
And if you're not part of, of Friday evenings, like many of us are actually who are here, you know, but Friday, and we, we was chatting, Ian mentioned about the Samaritan lady and uh, the well, the woman at the well. And uh, it's funny because I was, I was looking up that passage for, for my message today. And the thing that really struck me about that passage is how Jesus will shift your paradigms. Like, you think you think you know something, and if Jesus comes up and he's like, mm, nah, nah, nah. let me tell you what it's really all about. Yeah. And it's, oh man, I, I love it. I, I love the challenge Jesus gives my life. Yeah. Right? It, it's, it's bonkers, isn't it? How you can be living your life, and you're like, okay, things are going along, things are fairly comfortable, and then something comes into your life, you know, which totally like, blows everything that you expect and know out of water. And then Jesus teaches you something about that moment, that situation that is like theologically true, and you kind of knew it, but maybe you weren't really living it. Yeah? And so this this is this is the, the angle that I'm I'll kind of come at this from today. Maybe Jesus is gonna go, well may, maybe you, you knew something, but maybe we need to be out there and living it and focused on it and not being distracted by the googly as we're watching our favourite Marvel film or what have you. So John 4, John 4, it says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. Now most of us know this story, don't we? So a bit of context. So the story is, Jesus has been out on the road all day for a long time and he's got his disciples with him and he sends them off into town to go and get some food. And there's a lady, not just any lady, a Samaritan lady. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Samaritans were not like best mates with the Jewish people. You know, that they was part of the same nation once upon a time and then wars and factions divided them and then the Samaritans became like a, a, a byword for, for them over there. The people we don't associate with. The kinds of people that we don't even stop and talk to. So for Jesus to be talking to a Samaritan would have drawn a sharp intake of breath. <laughs> for him to be talking to a Samaritan woman, yeah. unheard of. Unheard of. It is, it is breaking the law. You know, it is outrageous. Jesus can be really outrageous, can sometimes? So, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship, us Jews worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Yeah. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Yeah. Man, that all by itself, you know, without, without taking the groundbreaking paradigm shift that happened in my mind, is, is enough to know that our worship isn't just a, a formula, it's not just something that we should do. But what takes this even further is that the Samaritans, they, they thought that they worshipped God. They knew that, in fact, the well that they was at was Jacob's well, mm. which you will find in the book of Genesis, where Jacob would take his flock of sheep to get them watered, to keep them alive. And these Samaritan people, they even knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet somewhere along the line, they lost their way a little bit. And this worship became something other than what God really seeks. So many of us could be living our Christian lives like a Samaritan woman, or like a Samaritan. We, we, we know it, we know the history of it, we might have done it our whole lives, but God is saying, no, I want you to worship me in the spirit and in truth. Mm. What, 
does that even mean? And what does that even look like? What is worship? In our modern Western minds, we, we automatically think of worship as, as being in a place of worship, doing a certain ritual or, or action, like, like coming to church and singing some hymns or songs, you know, that is worship, right? It's like that, that picture, we have that picture, Dave, of the worshipping hands. I didn't even, yes, we do, excellent. You know, we think of that, as funny as it is, as like, as worship. You know, if we can come to church and we can put our hands in the air and, and do these actions, that is our worship. Or maybe take a communion, that is boxed into the category of, of worship. And actually, yes, those things are worship, but it doesn't end there, right? Just coming to a place to worship is great, and we should. We, we, we need to be. You know what, this morning, you know, we may be few in number, but the worship isn't any less powerful, the worship isn't any less relevant, it isn't any less meaningful, God can still speak to you in that moment just as much now as you can when the room's packed and full. Because God is here, right? Mm. But that's not, that's just not it. That's not enough. Worship is an attitude and an application in all of life. Worship is an attitude and it is an application in all of our lives. From when we go from here on Sundays through to when we arrive back the following Sunday, our focus, our hearts, should be that of worship. Amen. And not being distracted from that. Yeah. And Googling along the journey. Google's a good thing. They help me write me notes. Yeah. <laughs> But Google is not where my, where my revelation came from. Amen. For some, the object of our worship can look radically different to what it is here. Right? For some, worship could be about a sports team, could be about football. Worship could be about a fashion influencer or someone that you look up to and you want to be like. It could be a writer, someone that's particularly impacted your life, so you follow everything that they say. Right now, I think many people worship Jordan B. Peterson. I think the guy's great, actually. You know, he's got a lot of really, really good and interesting things to say. But, but he cannot be the object of my worship. He can't be. I can learn. I can say, well done. But I'm not going to worship the it could be animals even. Some people worship animals. They'd rather see, and I, I have people like this who I work with, and Joel, pray for them. But I would rather see people get injured than animals hurt. Yeah? Yeah, that, that, yeah. anyway, I won't go into it. Yeah. <laughs> but even, even groups can be worshipped. Groups like you know, recovery courses, AA groups, like little knitting clubs, church, can be worshipped. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. All of these things can be an object of our worship, but we are supposed to be worshippers of God mm -hmm. as Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Psalm 100. Verses 1 through 5 says, Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with, with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. And the challenge, and I, I see who's here today, so, you know, I love you guys. And I 
I'm not aiming this particularly at anybody. But maybe if you're watching this online. <laughs> but how you worship in church is a reflection of your attitude of worship through the week. Right? I, I think if you can't commit regularly to Sundays and you worship God together in the body, then how are you going to be thinking worshipful thoughts on a Wednesday mm. or on a Friday? How you express yourself to God in church on a Sunday can carry on through the week. And if you're not expressing yourself in church on a Sunday, then what does your worship look like? Like, really? I mean, I've just said that worship isn't just about the Sunday morning experience. But it's got to start somewhere, hasn't it? If we turn up to church, we're like, oh, it's just another thing that I'll do in the week. It's just something that I'll tick off the list. Oh, it's a nice time. I'll get a good cup of coffee. You know, it's a nice cake that I have. Or, you know, I'll get to see my friends. Or, you know, whatever it is that goes along with your reasons for being in church. Aside from actually giving your heart over to him know that you're his child and that, you know, you're grateful for all that he's done for you. Amen. I mean, if he did nothing else, if, even if we don't see the kids, even if we don't see the place packed out, mm -hmm. even if all of these words over our church don't come to fruition, will we still worship? Even if it's just us, mm. for the rest of our days, will we still worship we will. and give him honour yeah. and glory? So, what are the benefits of worship? Because, you know, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, our Christian journeys are at various different stages, aren't they? And at mm -hmm. first, of course, you start coming on to church because your question is, what's in it for me? Now, what do I get out of this thing? Yeah? <laughs> me, me, me. What do I get out of this? And so, e even as we, we progress along in our, our Christian faith, yeah, sometimes, sometimes, like, like the Samaritan, we can lose our way a little bit, and then it still becomes about me, me. Because the second stage is all about, oh, I love you, Jesus. If you remember, I love you, Jesus. And then it's, well, what can I do for you, Jesus? And then we move on to kingdom thinking, right? This is, this is our progression into maturity. But we can still have the what's in it for me question at every stage of our Christian life. So, so here you go, what's in it for me? Worship gets your focus onto God. Yeah, amen. Right? Worship gets our focus off of, off of me. I'm having a, a rubbish day today. Man, like the children, not looking at anyone. <laughs> Drive me nuts! Like work, it's just it's just overwhelming, it's overbearing. Like the pressure is too much. My sickness is just oh, I'll just all I think about. And then you come into a time of worship, and it takes you away from that, and it puts your eyes on Him. And so worship gets us to focus on the most important part of our lives, mm -hmm. our relationship with God. Worship increases our understanding of God, you see, because when we're in that place of worship, you get a sense of the Father's heart, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know, there are psychological studies that have been done and, and all that kind of stuff that, that literally tell you that, that singing songs with other people, you know, does something psychologically to bring joy into your life mm -hmm. right but but just singing songs doesn't deepen your understanding but when you're worshiping yeah. you're brought into the father's presence Amen. and you understand his heart for you yeah. and his heart for those around you Hallelujah. you see and, and it's, it's so precious mm -hmm. because 
funeral is a good thing, but it's not going to bring you revelation. A heart of worship is where you get that. To worship, it, it helps us to build our confidence in God. This is another benefit. Now, when we're spending time in worship, just submitting our lives to Him and just giving Him praise and thanks and honour and glory and all of that, we, we, we just know that He's there, don't we? Yeah. You know, sometimes you can go through life, and we had this conversation on, on in Connect Group recently, like, how do you really hear from God? Well, well through worship. How do you do that? Well, for many of us, it might look slightly differently. Mm -hmm. For some, it might be you know, a walk in nature, and just looking at the beauty of creation and going, do you know what, this is wonderful out here. Like, I think God's amazing. Look, I, I had this random chat, I'm just deviating slightly now, but I had this random chat with Ruth, and she doesn't like it when I have random chats, because I tend to go off on them. But I was thinking the other day, I was thinking, man, if there were life on other planets, <laughs> What would it look like that is different to the life that we have on this planet? When you look at the wonder of creation, yeah. right, what could be any more different to a human than a spider? Or a jellyfish? <laughs> or an amoeba? Or you, you name it, right? You, you name the creature, all right, and how different they all are completely. I mean, what could an alien possibly look like? I mean, I've got no idea. I mean, it's, it's all on this planet, surely, isn't it? Anything that could have been thought up by the mind of God has to be on the planet, right? And so you might be in, in, in nature and you're like, wow, God, you like diversity of trees and birds and creatures and it's wonderful. And that might be how you worship. You might worship through like an intellectual stimulus. You know, you might like getting into the commentaries and the footnotes and or like all the nitty gritty and like, you know, where did the Samaritans go wrong? You know, you, you might really be like, oh, I want to get into the details of this stuff and love it. And you're like, yeah, that gets your juices flowing. You just honour God through that. And you're like, oh, thank you for this teaching, God. I thank you for, for broadening my life, expanding my mind, all of that. Stuff. Anyway, I'm, I'm going. You get me. Worship helps you build your confidence in God and you, you hear from God in worship. So how do we worship? How do we actually worship? In Romans, Paul kind of gives us an idea of, of how we should actually worship in, in lives. Um, he says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What is your true and proper worship? That the giving of your body in sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm. You know, because to worship is going to cost you something. Yeah. In the Old yeah. Testament, it cost them bulls and rams and goats and pigeons and all sorts of stuff. They come to the temple and they they offer all these things on the altar. It cost them something. Yeah. You might think, oh well, it's just mm -hmm. a bull or a ram or whatever. But that, that bull might have cost a year's wages. That might have been a year's labour to pay for that act of worship to God. And so the cost for Christians is you. Yeah. You are the price. You are the sacrifice. Your whole life, everything that you do with this thing, whether you're, you know, whether you you like this thing or not, yeah. everything that you do with it is an act of worship to something. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 What is it that we're worshiping? So it says, carries on. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, because when you're giving yourself in worship, and you're building your trust in God, and your confidence in God, and you're getting to the Father's heart, 
and you're living your life wholly in worship, you see the opportunities that he has for you. Mm. Yeah. You see the will that he has for your life. Mm. Someone might say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Well, start worshipping and God will open the opportunities yeah. for you. Amen. And you're able to discern his good and perfect and pleasing will. Amen. You're able to understand what direction you're supposed to be going in. Mm. What you're meant to be doing with this and this. So, he continues through chapter 12, Paul, writing about practical implications of worship. <laughs> I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, we've been here a long time. But it's real examples of living sacrifice that he talks about. Worship in action looks like being humble. Just being a humble person. You know, thinking of others more highly than you think of yourself. Giving your life over to the service of other people. Yeah. You know? When someone says, hey, can you come round and help me out? I've got a bit of a matter going on here. And you're like, man, I was just beating Barcelona 3 0 on like world class level of FIFA. <laughs> you put your controller down and you humble yourself and go and serve that yeah. person. Yeah. You know? You know, you know, you know. Talking to the choir, and I. It looks like serving others. It looks like honouring others. Worship looks like honouring others. And that's something we don't have much of in this world, isn't it? Yeah. You know? If people don't honour well from, from government, whatever you think of the government, they're appointed and positioned by God. We should pray for them, whether we agree with them or not. Yeah? yeah? You know, from, to, to all the, the, the different levels of governance that we have, to the police. I mean, the police are, are maligned in our country by so many. There's no respect. And this respect is being eroded through the levels, even down to the state of, of family. Right? How many stories, parents, have you heard of the teenagers who don't respect their parents, have no honour for their parents. I'm hoping, so, <laughs> but it, we'll, we'll get there, all right? And, and, you know, this won't be our story. But you hear it and see it all the time. Yeah. Honour has been eroded. People not telling you of their intentions, people not giving you proper due and worth and value. Anyway, remaining joyful is an act of worship. <coughs> we might be going through the worst time. The worst time. And that's, it's okay, to be honest, and say, oh, I'm going through a really bad time. But at the same time, you know, and Pastor Tony, you know, to give him honour, has, has modelled this so well for us. You know, when you've gone through a, a horrible experience in your, in your this, in your body, you know, and you're still yet coming to church yeah. and feeling like, oh, yeah. I want to be here. But you know what? I'm going to sing the songs. Yeah. I'm going to encourage other people. I'm going to impart my energy to you because you look like you need it. And you know what? Yeah. Remaining joyful is an act of worship. Being that encourager at work, even when work's junk, you're totally understaffed and like you've got no one to turn to, right? Yeah. Preach it, preach it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> being patient, being patient is an act of worship. Yeah, man. Right? Being patient with people who don't even deserve your patience yeah. is a higher act of worship. Being long suffering, you know, in, in that in those times, if people are just like they are, they are not there yet. But remember, it's this grayscale, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and wherever people are in the moment, we've just got to take where they are. I mean, we sing the song sometimes: "Come, come as you are to worship." Right? Wherever you are, come and worship God. 
So we've got to be patient with these people. They might not be there yet, but your patience with them is an honouring thing, it's an act of worship towards God. Mm -hmm. And finally, being faithful. Your faithfulness is an act of worship. Being faithful to serve, being faithful to honour, being faithful to be joyful, being faithful to spend time on your knees in prayer, being faithful to the vision of the church, being faithful to the people in your church, being faithful to the people outside of your church, being faithful to your family, being faithful to your friends, being faithful, being faithful, just being faithful. It's an act of worship. And in a couple of weeks' time, where Paul ends up on this, this, this bit of teaching, we're going to be talking about honour and submission and and submission is, is a word that man, no one likes it. No one's going to tell me what to do, right? You can't tell me what to do with my life. Well, submission says, well, maybe someone should be able to speak into your life. Maybe you shouldn't go for that job. Maybe you shouldn't bake that person. Maybe you shouldn't feed your children that food. I don't know. You can take your pick, can't you, on things we can submit to. But it's true. I was going to finish with the story of Asa. Maybe I will quickly. I'll just I'll, I'll run through it. In the Old Testament, there was a king called King Asa, the king of Judah, and he was coming under attack by the king of the northern tribes, Samaria. And King Asa, he knew what he should do. He should come and bow before God and, and worship God and get the direction where he should go. But he didn't want to do that. So he got the king of, of Damascus involved. He said, look, king of Damascus, you can have all the gold and silver out of the temple come and, and like make a treaty with this king of the northern tribes so that they won't bother me anymore. When it, God turns up in 2 Chronicles 16, it says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those parts that are fully committed to him. You, King Asa, have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. Man, he relied on himself. He wouldn't humble himself, he wouldn't worship God and seek God. And maybe for you, the war's not going to be against kings of Damascus or against, you know, Samaritans. Maybe the war's going to be within you. Yeah. Maybe you need to spend time in worship to take the focus on within you and put your focus on Him. Maybe sometimes, yeah, your, your war is going to be with other individuals. But actually, if you take your, your eyes off of that situation and you start to worship him, you realise that you're not at war with individuals, you're at war with powers and principalities that play in your life. And you can pray against that. Yeah. Maybe you're just going to discover that the war could easily be won. If you just bring yourself to him through the week, not just on a Sunday. Build your trust and your confidence in Him to fight the battle on your behalf. Okay, ranking it up. When we worship with an obedient heart and an open and repentant spirit, God is glorified. Christians are purified. The church is edified. And the lost are evangelized. These are all elements of true worship. Worshiping in the spirit and in truth. But the opposite is also true. When our lives are reliant on ourselves, we are stubborn towards God, we're closed to instruction and growth, and we bring disrepute on the church. And the lost are put off. The great quote from Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. 
We live in a world of distraction. We live in a world of short TikTok videos. We live in a world where we Google along with stuff that we're trying to focus on. And we love a great origin story. But maybe we need to get back to the heart of worship ourselves and spend time just in his presence through the week. Not just what we think maybe worship is on a Sunday morning or singing songs in the car, which is great and all, but maybe we need to start living our lives in submission, in honour, in love, faithfulness, serving others, and being humble, and allowing God to speak to our hearts in those moments. And then we can discern His good, and His perfect, and His pleasing will for our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. What is a Christian? Christian is one who trusts God and His Word and puts it into action. Father God, I thank you God for the Sundays. I thank you God that we get together, we get to worship. Father, I pray Lord that this heart of worship doesn't just stop right here and now, but it leads us through the week. And we keep that in our minds and our hearts as we travel through. Uh, when we have interactions with others, we recognise that, that all of them are an act of worship one way or the other. God, help us to realise that our bodies are the sacrifice of worship that you desire. So, Father, help us to live in light of this truth.